we get started, don't be shy about taking books. Little bitty book, what do we got here? 50 pages, what is the Great Commission? We call it the Great Commission for a reason. It's just, we, we can't think about it enough. So if you hadn't thought of it in a while, anyone want a small book about the Great Commission? Raise your hand. Way in the back. This is Elliot. Did you come get it? I'll put it right here. I don't have my kids. Kid had a fever last night, so I don't have my runners. All right, this is a brand new um, book by a guy named Dane Orland called Is Hell Real? A little book, just reflection on hell, which again, I don't think we think about enough in our current comfortable American context. So there we go, Nancy. Put it down here for you. One of my own uh, that we'll be talking about a little bit today called Missional Ecclesiology. The idea that we'll talk about today is that we as the church are a sent people. Again, man, we just keep the... And then we've got a sum for sale up here by Max Stiles. Uh, I don't know what they are. They're cheap. I think they're like five bones. Let's see. Five bucks. There you go. So if you're interested in that, really good book. Probably, probably one of the best on evangelism. We had Mac in for the Abilene Theology Conference a couple years ago. You can find those talks on our YouTube page. Those are really good too. And then here's a book called The Thing Is. This is a publisher called Matthias Media that we like a lot. They're out of Australia. One of the reasons that we like them, uh, Australia is just a few, probably couple decades ahead of us in terms of being so post-Christian. They've been there for a while. So they think really well about us in a missional, missionary posture towards our own culture because they've been there in Australia for a couple decades. They're ahead of us. And uh, they just do a really good job of majoring on the majors and keeping the main thing the main thing. We use as leadership a lot from Matthias Media. So we've trained home group leader with their material. If uh, part of our elder training, you have to read a book called The Trellis and the Vine, which is basically a book on ministry methodology. And this is like the normal person's version of The Trellis and the Vine. The deacons read this book several years ago. Got three copies. Sean's got one. I'm going to throw it to you. Watch your head. Oh, <laughs> Billy, you can come get that one. The thing is, great book. All right, let me pray and we'll begin. Father, we're thankful for your grace this morning, thankful for where the church gathered, thankful for another Sunday, favorite day of the week, where your spirit comes and loves to encourage us, remind us of who you are, remind us of who we are. Remind us of your love and remind us of our purpose. So we pray for that this morning as we kick off a new class. Make us more like Jesus. That's our prayer. Conform us to the image of Christ. We pray it in his name. Amen. All right. Well, I don't have any announcements, I don't think. VBS starts tonight. Uh, so if you're involved, thank you. What? Oh. Is that a thing? Is that the VBS thing? Okay. <laughs> Someone pointed out, we were, me and Eric, and uh, who was it? Who was in there? I think it was, uh, I think it was Hayes. Richardson was like, wait a minute, the keys are right there. How are they going to keep the bad guys in? But anyway, hopefully this doesn't fall on me. I think it's secure. Uh, be praying this week for the Lord to grab hearts of children. It's an immersive experience, lots of fellowship, lots of teaching, and so please make it a regular prayer request that the adults would endure and that the Spirit would grab the hearts of little kids uh, as they're here this week and just set them on a path of lifelong love for the Lord Jesus. Any other announcements that we need to know about? That's all I got. All right. Why are we here? Uh, several reasons. Um, one, we needed all these rooms to decorate for VBS. Uh, two, we wanted to give our normal Sunday school teachers a break. If you're in here, thanks for all your labor. Appreciate your work, uh, weekly work of teaching and on top of full-time jobs. So give them a break over the summer. And we've just been really encouraged the last couple summers as we've done this to get everybody together for a season and think, uh, think, but also to be with one another. So we want, we'd love for you to get here about 8.55 and we'll try to start at 9, 10 or so. And that's so that y'all can be intentional. So don't take a seat just yet and get to know one another. Probably there's people in this room that doesn't know one another. And so it's a great time to meet people and so that's part of it, too, is just to help us gel as a faith family so we can come all together. Um, and one of the main purposes we feel like as leadership that we want to focus and, and press and double-click on the theme of evangelism. 
There's so many encouraging things about what the Lord's doing at Southside right now. Uh, we're encouraged by so much. One of the areas that we're always wanting to ask is, Lord, what do you need to work on? And this is probably the case with every church. Probably every church, weakness is evangelism. Uh, just because it's probably every Christian's weakness. And so we just want to spend some focused time thinking about being more outward focused as a congregation. I think that one of the main ways we'll see when we're strong, or one of the way, way, main ways we are seeing that we are strong is on our Sunday night prayer meetings. If you've been coming, it's so encouraging to hear about gospel conversation after gospel conversation. And so much of the prayer time on Sunday nights, our first and third Sunday nights, tonight's, we're not meeting because of EBS, is about evangelistic conversations. So that's a huge sign that, okay, this is happening. Encouraged by that. You know what the even bigger sign will be that the Lord's, not only that we're getting there as a church, but that the Lord's hand is upon us, is when we're baptizing new believers. And that's really where we're at as leadership. That's what we're praying. We want to see the church grow by conversion. We want people being moved from darkness to light. Uh, not just your, 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 you know, Abilene church transfer that's going to happen, and that's fine and good in some ways, but we want to see people converted, like early church stuff, book of Acts stuff. And how's that going to happen? It's going to happen from you sharing the gospel. If it's going to be left to the clergy, I mentioned last week uh, in Acts chapter 8, there's persecution that comes and everybody's scattered and the gospel goes forward, quote, except for the apostles. And so if it's left to the apostles, we're not apostles, but if we're the, the professional Christians whose day job it is to be in ministry, we're just not going to get anywhere in terms of evangelism. Part of it is because we're with y'all all the time. I know so few Christians. I'm, I mean, I'm, it's just pathetic how many, sorry, non-Christians. Non-Christians. <laughs> Got some church discipline to do, don't we? I know so few non-Christians, it's pathetic. Part of it's just, man, I just have very few opportunities. Got five little kids at home. I'm not able to get out in the evenings a lot uh, to meet people. Um, and I'm with y'all. And so same with our staff. But you all, man, I get jealous of how many non-Christians y'all get to rub shoulders with sometimes on a daily basis. So how are we going to grow in this area? Y'all, not us. It's left to us. You know, our job is to equip you, Ephesians 4, the ascended Christ gave the church gifts, one of which is pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So this summer is about equipping, equipping you all uh, to grow in evangelism. What we want to be on guard, especially churches like us, that value the Bible, rightly so. But what we're going to be on guard is becoming ingrown. And that can happen in churches like ours. Becoming ingrown and so focused about us and our particulars and being right about this and having a certain adversarial posture towards everything else. We want to be on guard for that. Why? For one, it's just not the heart of God. But two, it's, it's pharisaical, right? Who is Jesus' number one antagonist in the Gospels? It actually wasn't the world. It was the religious leadership. We'll see more of that today in our sermon. And so we want to be on guard against Phariseeism. And the, one of the main ways to do that is to be outward focused, not growing inward focused. And so we want to grow in this because, hey, we want uh, you to do the ministry. We want you to have the joy. We do want to grow by conversion. Uh, but we also want to remain healthy. And health comes when we're focused outside. I mentioned that as well in the sermon on Acts 2. Acts 2 community, which is just a sweet and countercultural reality, only comes when we're working on Acts 1 mission together, being empowered by the Spirit to go witness Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. So we want to we wanna refocus. We want every one of you thinking, all right, how can I be involved with the mission of God? That's the other reason why we're here together. Any questions about any of that? The nice things about Sunday school is we can, we can talk together instead of just monologue. Don't be shy. Kevin. Street, yeah, has the church ever done street evangelism? Yes, uh, they have. And one of the things we want to do, we wanted to do, gosh, a year ago, is uh, the, an initiative basically to learn first. And so, Lord willing, this summer, we will start that process over and first just learn our neighborhood better. So it won't be a bait and switch deal. I'm okay with bait and switches, by the way. But this won't be a bait and switch deal. The gospel is that important and hell is real. But we want to do that uh, this summer, this fall, just learn first and then see what's next, which will involve that. Yeah. But even more than that, what we want is y'all focused in your neighborhood and in your workplace. We do want to do some stuff here locally, but there's more natural 
rubbing shoulders with people that you work with and live by. Any other questions? All right, having said all that, there's going to be a lot more than just evangelism these next 10 weeks. So even today, we're not going to talk a lot about evangelism this morning. We're going to talk about a bigger picture deal that feeds into it. But here's what we're going to do. Next 10 weeks, here's the session titles. And uh, we'll have a rotation of teachers uh, that will be doing these. There's 10. Number one, here's, the, here's just the titles. This is what we're doing today. Are you into what God's up to? Evangelism and God's purpose in history. So it's going to be a very big 30,000-foot view of Scripture and history this morning. Number two, what's our role in evangelism? I think Cooper's doing that one. God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. So let's have a good theology of evangelism. That matters a lot so that we do God's work God's way. Number three, what's the gospel? That's kind of important. What is it that we're wanting to share? We want every member, this is part of why we do membership interviews, to be able to just speak the gospel really clearly. So we want to spend a whole session on that. Number four, so what happened to you learning how to share the gospel through your testimony? Easy way to do that. Number five, they believe this too, the local church and the power of corporate witness. Again, that's the strength of this book here, this $5 book, as he talks about evangelism in the context of the local church. Number six, how do I get others on board discipling others in evangelism? Number seven, what if they reject me? A rejection, rejection follow up in the fear of man. Number eight, but what if they ask? Answering objections to the gospel. Number nine, how do I get started being intentional and strategic in evangelism? And then number 10, how do I share the gospel with family and coworkers? So that's where we're headed over the next 10 weeks. I hope you can make it. If, you, you know, if you're out of town, that's okay. They don't, they're not really, they don't really build on one another, so we understand it's summer. But if you're here, be here. So purpose. What's the purpose of God? It's a big question. There's a philosopher named... Alistair McIntyre, who's got this line, I actually haven't read the book, but he's got this line that I've heard multiple times. I've shared it with y'all multiple times. And it's basically before we get about doing what it is that we need to do, we need to know what story we're a part of. Before we're going to talk about our individual actions, we need to have the bigger narrative in mind. And I think that's so true. We all, we're narrative people. We always have been. We operate out of a mental map and a framework. And so we want to know, what is it? What's the biblical mental map? What's the biblical framework? So we're just talking big picture. What's God's purpose? And there's lots of ways we can talk about this. Lots of ways to summarize it. Why? Because it's a really big book. So I'm just going to talk about a few ways to think about God's, God's purpose and history. In other words, the big picture of the Bible. One of the main ways, and again, you can use this sharing the gospel. We talk a lot about God, sin, Christ, response, and our session this summer will be mostly focused on that. And that's kind of that individualistic stream of the gospel, but there's also the more corporate cosmic, and that's where we think about creation, fall, redemption, new creation. What's the story of the Bible? At its simplest, creation and new creation. But four hooks you can use is creation, fall, redemption, new creation. So creation, God created the world. We want to start in Genesis 1, not Genesis 3. Sometimes our circles can do that. God created all things and it was good. And he created humans and they were good, made in his image and marriage. And then you have the fall. So you think about creation and God is creator and God is authority and God is good and God is loving. Creation, but very quickly fall. So mankind is made as the glory of creation, but also in some ways the garbage of creation because how quickly we try to turn God into our own image. So Genesis 3, and you have the fall. You all know these stories. If not, Genesis 1 to 3, if you're new, new to the, the Bible, Genesis 1 to 3 is worth reading and rereading and reading and rereading. There's just so much there. And in Genesis 3, what you have is basically mankind rebelling against their maker, against their creator. God had structured things and given commands and really two fundamental problems. The enemy comes in, he's a problem, but then he tells them two, two main lies. Number one, you don't need God's rule. You don't need him. You should be able to rule yourself. You'll be like God if you just listen to me instead of listen to his good word. And so that's been the fundamental problem from here to now. Auto this issue of autonomy. I want to rule myself. No one will tell me how to live. That's the first thing. The issue of authority and specifically God's authority. And again, man, so much of today, Pride Month, so much of really what we see in June is the issue of autonomy. No one else will tell me how to live, including God. Alicia and I are watching a documentary. We watched one of them last night. I won't share it because I don't recommend it. But it's about, it's about the deconstruction of Christian faith, basically. And it's a bunch of uh, super theologically and probably political liberal folks just criticizing all things right wing. 
And um, again and again and again, they're talking about authority, authority, authority. They're bashing authority. And they don't like any hierarchy whatsoever, whether it's God, whether it's in the family, whether it's in the government. And it started right there in Genesis 3, didn't it? Autonomy. That's the first lie. Second lie is similar to that, and it's we're going to redefine good the way we want to, right? I know God said this, but did he really say? And so he, the enemy comes in and tells us that we can be the ones who determine what's right and wrong. That's the whole idea of knowing good and evil. You'll be the ones who know. It's not that they'll just know. It's they'll be the ones who determine, again, autonomy. So you have fall. It goes, it goes bad. Creation, fall, redemption right there in Genesis 3. And we'll turn to some of these passages in a moment. But God promises that he's going to send a deliverer, a redeemer. He's going to overturn the curse. And so really the rest of the Bible from Genesis 3 all the way to the rest is God's plan of redemption. He's taking back the world. He's restoring his rule. He's creating a people of praise. And so we learn that through all of the Old Testament, the New Testament. Ultimately it lands in many ways where it started, Genesis 1, 2.0, Eden 2.0, new creation. So heaven is this world redeemed, Romans 8, 1 Corinthians 15, 2 Peter 3. Eschatology includes ecology. We don't think about it enough, I don't think. We think of heaven and we think of this ethereal, Gnostic, you know, fat, floaty babies on harps. That's not what the Bible teaches about new creation. It's new creation. It's physical bodies, resurrection. So creation, fall, redemption, new creation. What's God's purpose in history? Well, there's one way. To describe it another way, another four hooks, very similar, is creation, sin, exile, restoration. And maybe you can use this when it comes to sharing with people who maybe feel lost or feel out of place. You can use different ways of sharing the story of the gospel with with people depending on where they're at. Some people need to hear about Sin and guilt. Some people are very guilty and they need that. They need a different slant or different angle or different emphasis. So maybe this is one that speaks of our lostness and exile. So think about the biblical story. Creation, all things are good. Now we're talking about relationship a little bit more. So Adam and Eve are with their creator. He's walking with them in the cool of the garden. Everything is good, very good. Seven times, right? But then you have the enemy come in and tell those same lies. And tragically, they're kicked out of the garden, right? They are the ones who are called to cultivate the garden, keep the garden, guard the garden. And ultimately, they're kicked out and God puts up cherubim and they're guarded from the garden. They're kicked out. They're moved from God's presence, not allowed back in, exile. They're exiled, they're lost, they're away from God's presence, they're away from home. And so then you have restoration, creation, sin, exile, restoration. What's one way to think about God's purpose in history? He's bringing his people back home. That's why there's that little covenant formula with every covenant in scripture. They will be my people and I will be their God. Bringing them back home to their place, which is ultimately new heavens, new earth, new creation, where the whole world is Eden 2.0. And we're going to be with him at home again. So creation, sin, Exile, restoration is another way to think about God's purpose in history. What is he up to? Another way, last one, is kingdom through covenant, which is the title of a book of one of my profs at, at Southern Seminary. What is God's purpose in history? He's bringing about his kingdom, and he's doing it through the biblical covenants. We'll look at a couple of those covenants in a little while. But the idea is God established his rule in, in the garden, and his people were to rule on his behalf, and they've lost that rule. They want to rule themselves. And so through each covenant in Scripture, which are really good ways to hook yourself on the big picture, God is bringing about his kingdom until ultimately the new covenant where Jesus' message is what? Repent, believe the good news, the kingdom of God is at hand, and Jesus is restoring his rule that there was in the beginning, but with escalation and advancement. Two sentences. One, what's the story of the Bible? It's about the snake crusher who brings us back to the garden. There it is. Bunch of theology in that one sentence. The snake crusher who brings us back to the garden. Or, I think I heard Doug Wilson say this first. What's the story of the Bible? Kill the dragon, get the girl. What's the girl? It's the church. It's the church. And so you have this offspring of the woman who comes and crushes the enemy, 
and wins a bride, purchases a people, gets the girl. All right, let's open the Bible. Flip to the beginning, Genesis 1-1. Any questions, comments on any of those big picture ways to think about the purpose of God before we just look at some of them? So in that, in that schema, creation, sin, exile, restoration begins really Genesis 3.15 and is culminated ultimately in new heavens, new earth, resurrection. Resurrection of us as our bodies and resurrection of the whole world. So that's a lot of Bible under restoration. But he starts it there in so many ways. And he works it out progressively over time till it culminates in the world redeemed. Any others? Creation, fall, redemption, new creation. Creation, sin, exile, restoration. Kingdom through covenant. Snake crusher. Gets the girl. Brings us back to the garden. I think it's helpful to have big picture hooks. Like, what's the story of the Bible? Here it is. A few options for you. All right, let's just think, let's just do walk, walk through some of these. We've already, you know, made some of the connections. I just want you to see it in the Bible and uh, we'll, again, the question is, what is God's purpose in history? So Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, there we go. So much right there. God's the creator. Therefore, he tells us how to live. He knows best. He's the one who created. And it's always important to remember there was a lot of history before this, right? This isn't when it all got started. This is when creation got started. But God, our triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, had existed for all eternity before this. And he was totally content and happy in the fellowship of the Trinity. He did not need to create us. That's an important point. He does not need us. Acts 17 is false preaching to those pagans in the Mars Hills. As though he needed anything. Theologians call it the aseity of God. It's one of my favorite attributes. Aseity. It means from himself. He has no need. We didn't complete him or anything like that. He didn't have to create. But he did. And so he's the sovereign, loving, self-sufficient authority. And he creates ultimately for his glory. That's what Isaiah 43 verse 7 says. I whom I created for my glory. Look at Genesis 1, verse 26. Here we have the, the human job description. So he creates us. What are we here for? 126. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion, rule, over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion, he says it again, over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. So here's God creating and giving us, giving us our first job description, our vocation. And it's mostly about what we do. Who are we as humans? It's about what we do, and every one of us does this because every one of us is made in the image of God. We have dominion. We rule. So we, we take the created stuff, and so think about what your job is. Part of it is taking the potential of whatever it is you do, whether it's spreadsheets to laundry, and you, you bring out the potential that's there, and you bring it into the lordship of, in this case, God. You rule on his behalf. You represent. You mimic him. You mirror him. That's what's going on here. You have dominion. So you, in your little spheres of influence, whether it's home or work or church or whatever it is, you're bringing God's rule to bear. You're representing him. You're having dominion. And part of it is getting married and having babies. That's why we often joke around Southside, one of the things we do is we make babies, we make culture. That's not to say that single people are devalued at all. It's just saying that for most of, most of history, for most of God's people, marriage and children are normative. That's why the command's here, be fruitful and multiply, have babies, fill the earth, and make culture, basically. Cultivate the worlds. That's what he's saying. And so zoom out again. God's kingdom, right? Create some here in the, in the garden, and says multiply and fill the earth. At this point in the story, there's just the Garden of Eden. And had there been no sin, it would have looked like this. 
babies and more babies and training in the law of God and the authority of God, and then they would multiply and they would fill the earth. They would move the garden. Basically, they would expand the garden. They would make Eden ultimately the whole world. That would have been the goal, that they take the rule and presence of God and spread it and spread it and spread it until the glory of the Lord fills the world as the waters cover the sea. How do the waters cover the sea? They are the sea. That would have been the plan. It wasn't God's plan because of sin in so many ways. Now, at this point, we're getting back on track. So rule, multiply, have dominion. Show the world what God is like. Look at chapter 2, verse 7. Then, skipping ahead a little bit, then the Lord God formed the man of dust. Chapter 2, by the way, zooms in on that last part of chapter 1. So we're zooming in here. Chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And so you have this garden. By the way, we ought to think of this as a temple. It's like a little temple. Why? Because what is a temple? It's where God dwells. It's the special. It's, God's everywhere, right? But he, he dwells especially in holy places, tabernacle, temple. And that's what Eden is. That's where God is. And Adam is like the first priest. He's in there and he's guarding the temple. He's, at least he was supposed to guard the temple as a priest does, keeping it pure. It's what he should have been doing, crushing snakes and whatnot. We know that he fails, but he was a priest and he was to work and to keep. Look at verse 15, chapter 2. The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Those are two verbs that in Hebrew occur together only one other time in the whole Hebrew Old Testament, and it's in Numbers, and it's about priests. What do priests do? They work and they keep, just like Adam was to work and to keep. And so he's this first priest leading his family in the ways of God, and he's to expand the rule of God, the presence of God, as his family multiplies. That would have been the goal. In other words, he was to take that little temple and make that temple the whole world. It's one way to think about the Bible is the uh, restoration of God's temple, Eden 2.0. And so God comes and dwells in in the tabernacle later in the biblical story. And then the permanent structure was the temple. And then God leaves the temple because of idolatry. And he never comes back until Acts chapter 2 when the glory cloud descends. Again, not on a place, but on a people. The church is the temple, 1 Corinthians 3.16, 2 Corinthians 3. The church is the temple. We're now his presence on earth. And we are to spread his rule. Every time we evangelize and someone comes to the Lord, his presence is expanded. And we're to do that till he returns. And when he returns, what does Revelation tell us about the, the world? It's going to be a perfect cube. Actually, it can't be literally. That wouldn't work, right? But it's symbolically showing what else in the whole Bible was a perfect cube? The holy of holies. So the whole world will eventually be the holy of holies, his presence everywhere, the temple. What's his purpose in history? It's to spread his presence all over the world till it covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. So we talked about the fall already in Genesis 3. Just look at Genesis 12 because these promises are so vitally important. You Bible people know these. What's God's purpose and plan? Well, well, actually, hold on. We skipped one. I I mentioned it, but we need to read it. I want your Bible, your eyes on the text. Look at 315, that first gospel promise. God tells the serpent, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And so we have a declaration of war here. There's going to be this perpetual enmity between the offspring of the woman and the offspring of the serpent. But ultimately, we have promised victory because the offspring of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent, even though his heel will be bruised. So right here, we're promised victory. It's going to happen. This offspring of the woman is going to defeat evil. He's going to win. And so in some ways, again, the rest of the Bible is asking, when is this offspring of the woman going to come and defeat evil? The snake crusher who's going to bring us back to the garden. Look at Genesis 12, promises to Abram. Remember, Abram was just a total pagan. He was a moon worshiper. And God calls him with sovereign grace and makes some some of the most astounding promises in the whole Bible to him. Genesis 12, 1, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country... And from your kindred in your father's house to the land that I will show you and I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. 
I'll bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And here's the foundational principle, a promise, I mean, there at the end. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so he calls out this total random pagan and says, here's the promises. I'm going to bless you. You're going to be a receiver of blessing. But not only will you receive blessing, you're going to be a mediator of blessing. So I'm going to bless you, but then I'm going to bless the whole world, all the families of the earth through you. And we learn later that it's through his offspring. And we learn later, Galatians 3.16, that his offspring is singular. Jesus Christ is the offspring of Abraham. So right here, we have a blueprint for the rest of world history. What's God doing? He's going to form a people, and their very existence is going to be so that they might bring blessing to the rest of the world. Right from the beginning, the people of God were a so that people. Right from the beginning is their form. They are blessed so that they will be a blessing. Blessed in order to be a blessing. Who? To all the families of the world. That's so important. This is why it's so tragic, as even we'll see today. In our text, it's so tragic what happened with the Jewish leadership. Did they take this calling seriously? Did they view their identity as being the means by which God would bless the world, specifically bless the Gentiles? The whole purpose of the people of Israel here is to bring blessing to the Gentiles. But what happened by the time of Jesus? Remember Luke 4? Jesus is beginning his ministry and he comes to the synagogue and he opens up the Isaiah scroll and he reads from Isaiah and he talks about, he actually just points out two stories in the Bible. Y'all remember this? Two stories in the Bible where there were needy Israelites, but God chose to bless Gentiles. It was all Luke 4. And do you remember how they responded to Jesus reading their Bible? Tried to kill them. Tried to throw him off a curb, but Jesus in his elusive way, in his ninja way, just somehow slipped through the crowd. They didn't get him. Why? How dare you bring up blessing to the Gentiles? They hated the Gentiles. There was a daily Jewish prayer. This is, God, I thank you that I'm not a woman, I'm not a slave, and I'm not a Gentile. There was a Jewish writing that said Gentiles were only created to be fuel for the flames of hell. Blessed to be a blessing to the Gentiles? They got a little off. That was the issue. It was one of the main reasons Jesus got killed. He didn't preserve their, at the end of the day, self-righteousness that manifested itself through ethnocentrism. So instead of saying, here we are as being the vehicle for God's blessing to the world, they said, here we are and we're better than everybody else. So the intention was blessed to be a blessing. What ended up happening was blessed so that I can hoard the blessings and not share them with anyone else. Moving down the storyline, God creates his ex, uh, Exodus 19, creates again the nation. So God promised Abraham, I'd create a nation from your offspring. Exodus, he does, right? He pulls them out of Egypt and he creates a nation just like he promised he would. In Exodus 19, he gives them a job description. And what is it? It's to be a kingdom of priests. Exodus 19, four to six. The whole nation then is to what? What do priests do? They're mediators, right? And so the whole nation was to be this corporate mediation between who? God and the people. And God put Israel in this really, you look at your map, this really strategic place in the world. So it was, what's the word I'm looking for? You had to, you had to go through it to get anywhere. What's the word I'm looking for? Crossroads. Crossroads, perfect. This major crossroads so that all these pagan nations would come through. And they were supposed to be this countercultural, that's why the law is so meticulous, countercultural people showing the rest of the world what it looks like to live under the, the rule of God. And so the whole thing was to be priests. Of course, again, we know that that didn't work, right? It didn't, didn't happen. So there's promises in the Old Testament, the prophets, that he would bring a king. So maybe that's what we need. We need a king. That's what they thought. We need a king like the nation. So God promises them a king. Gives them a king. It's not Saul. Ultimately, David's not it. It's, not, it's going to be a son of David. Well, no, Solomon. He kind of turns it all upside down. It's not going to be Solomon. We're waiting for another king. Then he has all these promises about a new covenant. God's going to make his people new. That's what they need. And Isaiah uses the language in Isaiah 49, and they will be a light to the nations. In other words, God's saying, what I'm going to do to you is I'm going to make you what you always intended to be. I'm going to make you a blessing to the world. I'm going to make you so that people, so that now you will be a light to the nations. You won't be like 
the nations anymore. You're going to have a new heart by the Spirit, and I'm going to make you a light to the nations. And then ultimately, new creation comes. Flip over to Ephesians chapter 1. God's purpose in history. The Bible's a big book, lots of ways to talk about it. It's a big question. This is, I think, the thesis verse of the book of Ephesians, and I think it's the thesis verse of the Bible. Therefore, I think it's the thesis statement of the whole world. Here it is. Why does the world exist? Look with me at Ephesians 1, pick it up at verse 9. Making known to us the mystery of his will, what's God's will, according to his purpose, what's God's purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan, what's God's plan, for the fullness of time, here it is, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. What is God doing in world history? He's uniting all of it in Christ. He's making Christ the head. He's summing up, summing up, bringing to a head all things in Jesus Christ. What's the purpose of God? That Christ would be all in all. Colossians 1.16 says much the same. So what does that mean then for our individual lives? This needs to be centered on Christ. Everything we do needs to have him right here. And that's why the Bible uses the language of the cornerstone. It's that first and most important stone in the structure that everything else is aligned around. And then as a church, what does our, our thing need to be? You know, churches can get off kilter and make their thing politics or, or the spirit or a certain branch of theology. Or, or we can have dangers of making our church about expositional preaching and elder leadership. What does our church need to be focused on? Christ. Individuals, churches, families, Christ. Him. We want to see him exalted. And where we see him exalted, we're happy about it. Philippians 1, if Christ is preached, we rejoice. What's God's purpose in history? To unite all things in Christ. Flip over a chapter, we get a kind of a, basically a footnote on that purpose. It gives us a little more flesh to it. 3.9. Notice that was 1.9. This is 3.9. What's God's purpose? He was going to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church... Us, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. What's God's eternal purpose? 311, it's the church. And in Ephesians specifically, it's the unity of the church. And so as we are united around Jesus Christ, we are showing God's wisdom to the powers and principalities. That's why Sunday mornings are no small thing. As we come in here, unified around seeing Christ exalted, and as we sing and as we encourage one another in the faith, what we're doing is showing the demonic realm how wise our God is. No small thing. In evangelism, what we're wanting to do is bring more and more into it. Flip over to Luke 24. Last words of Jesus in Gospel of Luke. So you'll notice there, my Bible has a subheading there at verse 13, on the road to Emmaus, starting in 13. Hopefully you know the story. There's these discouraged disciples think it's all over. He says, we thought, where's it at? We thought he was the one to restore Israel. And Jesus says, I am. It's just not the way you expected. That's what I came to do. Don't be foolish. Don't be slow of heart to believe. Everything that was written there, verse 25. Let's pick up at verse 44. Speaking of resurrection, right before verse 44, Jesus eats fish. I just find that funny. While they disbelieved, here's the resurrected Christ, verse 41. While they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, I'm hungry. Any fish tacos? Theological question for you. What happened to that food as it was digested? What does that mean for the new creation? Resurrected body had uh, hunger and fish tacos. A little freedom there with the translation. 
He ate it before in verse 44. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Which, by the way, sometimes people are like, man, wouldn't it have been awesome to be there to hear that sermon and see what Jesus did as he opened their minds to see all the scriptures? We do. We have it. It's called your New Testament, specifically the book of Acts. One of the richest ways to study the Bible is show how the New Testament uses the Old Testament, how the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, and it does so on every page. Why do the apostles do that? They learned it from Jesus. Everything written must be fulfilled in him. Verse 45, verse 46, and he said to them, thus it is written, he's talking about his Old Testament, that the Christ, the Messiah, the King, the Anointed One, the Son of David, should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. So that's part of it. What is the story of the Old Testament? That the King would come and defeat death. What else though? That's not all. Verse 47, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So he tells these discouraged disciples, listen, you don't know your Bible, man. You should know your Bible. I mean, it stinks to get that rebuke, right? Verse 25, oh, foolish ones. And slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And he shows them from the Old Testament that two things must happen. The King, the Christ, the Messiah must die. And the gospel must go forward to all nations. Right there, verse 47, repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. That was the whole point. Not just believe in the Messiah, but believe in the Messiah and then go proclaim him to all nations. That's the purpose of God. So when we're talking about the purpose of God in history, one helpful way to think about it is the mission of God. We reframe what we're doing in light of what he's doing. What he's doing informs our activity. And so what is the mission of God? I really like this definition. There's a scholar named Chris Wright. He's an Old Testament scholar. He was a disciple of John Stott. And uh, he's got a couple books that I like a lot. Here's how he defines it in two different books. What is the mission of God? Again, we're trying to, we're trying to encapsulate a lot of Bible in one sentence. You're not going to get it all, but this is, a good, this is a good start. The mission of God is to, quote, rid his whole creation. I don't know if I don't have a slide for this, do I? No, my bad. To rid his whole creation of evil and create for himself a people redeemed from every tribe and nation of humanity as the population of the new creation. To rid his whole creation of evil and create for himself a people redeemed from every tribe and nation of humanity as the population of the new creation. Here's another way he talks about what's God's mission. God in his sovereign love has purpose to bring the sinful world of his fallen creation to the redeemed world of his new creation. And so what is the Bible about? It's about the mission of God. God has a mission. And I think it's just helpful for us to frame our mission in light of his mission. The way someone has put it is it's not, that, it's not that the church has a mission for God. It's that God has a church for his mission. And this is what I'm getting in that little blue book, Missional Ecclesiology, is that the purpose of the church now is to be blessed in order to be a blessing. The purpose of our existence is not just for us to get in nice holy huddles and read a lot of books. Y'all know I'm for that. It shouldn't stop there. That's foundational for what we then go and do in our seven days a week, nine to five. Blessed in order to be a blessing. Missional. It's just the adjective of the noun missionary. It's one of our core values. It means that we see ourselves as sent wherever we go because God's on mission and we're part of the people of God. Jesus said in John 20, as the Father sent me, I send you. And so every one of you are sent, at least right now, to Abilene and the surrounding area. And so part of what we want you to do is, is view yourself as one who's sent to be an ambassador of the risen Lord Christ in all that you do. God has a church for his mission. And that's really what the whole Bible's about, right? That's what I'm trying to show. It's showing what he's doing. And at the end of the day, what are the, so many of the New Testament letters about? Let me just ask, what are so many of the New Testament letters about? Not the Gospels, but the letters. Just, I'm talking big picture, general. What are most of them about? The of the Say it again. The of the 
The gospel in the church. Okay, what else? What are other ways to say it? Evangelism. Okay, what else? Church ministry. ministry. All right. How to live together. Yeah, that's a big theme. Still missing one of the main ones. Church discipline. discipline. Okay. And say it again. The kingdom. kingdom. I'm thinking specifically, Mr. Williams here is on specifically, not just discipline as an excommunication, but hey, get your act together. Isn't so much of it a rebuke? I mean, think about it for a moment. Um, Philippians 3, watch out for the dogs. Um, Philippians 4, Paul calls out, you idea and sync to key, would you get it together, please? Live in harmony together. Don't be selfish. How about Corinth? Man, they were a hot mess. Yet, Paul begins calling them saints. But Corinth is basically literally chapter 1 and 2, dealing with the cross. Chapter 3, dealing with divisions. Chapter 4, a lot of divisions as well. And personality calls. Chapter 5, church discipline because of incest. Chapter 6, lawsuits among the congregation and prostitution. Chapter 7, people uh, married not having sex and not knowing what to do with marriage. Chapter 8, 9, 10, 11, idolatry. Chapter 12, 13, 14, they're all messed up with spiritual gifts. Chapter 15, some have stopped believing the resurrection. Galatians. He starts out, comes out hot with a rebuke. You're forgetting the gospel. I mean, I could go on and on. So many of the letters are written to correct false thinking and false living. What's the point of that? Do you ever zoom out? It's because if they have faulty thinking and faulty theology and division, they can't do the mission well. The letters are written to shape the church so that they might be on effective mission. That's the purpose. It's not just that we can have little clean houses that are in order. And again, we got to always be on guard about that. It's so that we can become who we were meant to be, a so that people. The Bible is the record, the product, and the tool of the mission of God. It's the record. It tells us what he's been doing. It's the tool. God's spirit has invested his power through this word. It's the tool for mission. And then it's the product. It's the result of it, the mission of God. So how can we put some of this together? Here's this quote from The Thing Is. So this is uh, focusing a little bit on bringing it home. And I I thought this was good, and then I'll share share two ways. Try to make a case here. Because God's grand purpose for creation is to transfer forgiven, forgiven rebels into his son's kingdom and to transform them into his son's image, salvation and holiness, if that's God's grand purpose, then... His purpose for my life is that I should die with Christ and rise to new life in his kingdom, become a Christian, press forward to maturity in Christ by putting sin to death and putting on the character of Christ, pursue holiness, in love, help move others from wherever they are towards maturity in Christ by prayerfully speaking God's word to them. Let's focus here for a moment because this is where we're at this summer. What is the purpose of your life? You're here, you've trusted Christ, you're pursuing him. Praise God, so many of you are doing just that so well. And the last one, but here it is. If this is all right, what is the purpose? It's that in love, we would help move others. And I love the vagueness here because this is why we do D groups right here. D groups are helping believers move from wherever they are towards maturity. At staff, we talk a lot about moving to the right. So here's conversion. Here's the resurrection. This is Christ-likeness. We want to move them towards Christ-likeness. But listen, if they're not a Christian and that's where we're at this summer, this is the same goal, right? In love, we want to help by the Spirit of God move them from wherever they are, in this case unbelief, to believing and then growing in Christ. In love, helping others move from wherever they are towards maturity in Christ by prayerfully speaking God's word to them. All right, next one. Those last three statements are really a summary of what it means to be a Christian. It means living a new life in Christ Jesus that reaches into every corner of our daily existence. Tony Payne. I think that's helpful. Here's here's the way they put it in one of their more uh, hefty books. God's goal for the whole world and the whole of human history is to glorify his beloved son in the midst of the people he has rescued and transformed. Again, Ephesians 1, unite all things in Christ. God's goal for the world and the whole of human history is to glorify his beloved son in the midst of the people he has rescued and transformed. 
All right, one more way. I'm just trying to shower you with multiple ways. I've shared this with you before. I find it super helpful. I've never heard from anybody that you found it helpful. I'm going to give it to you anyway. The whole history of God's purpose in 10 statements. Got them for you. In fact, I'll put these on Facebook again. What's his purpose? Number one, God created the world and humans to know him, represent him, and rule on his behalf. That's Genesis 1. Know, represent, rule. Know, that's the relation aspect. Represent him. That's our character. We want to be like him. And then rule on his behalf. That's have dominion for his sake. That's our mission, broadly defined here from Genesis 1. Number two, humanity preferred their own rule to God's rule, and the result was death and destruction, the image of God now marred. So we're still made in the image of God. All people are, but now it's marred because of sin. We don't faithfully reflect him anymore. Number three, God formed a people to be a royal priesthood and promised a forever king for everyone. That's getting at the promises of kingship. He formed his people, Exodus, to be a royal priesthood, promised a forever king for everyone. Number four, now getting into the New Testament, God sent the Savior King to restore his rule on earth as in heaven. That's kingdom language. That was Jesus' main theme. Number five, Jesus lived a perfect life died a substitutionary death on the cross and was raised from the dead and was enthroned at God's right hand as king of the worlds. That's the gospels. Number six, Acts. He then launched a spirit-filled community of ambassadors to bear witness to his rule in all of life. That applies to everything we do. We want to bring the lordship of Christ to bear over our thoughts, our feelings, our marriages, our parenting, our finances, our use of time, our consumption of media, our recreation, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all things in the name. I mean, do all things for the glory of God. I started to quote Colossians 3. Whatever you do, do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Number seven, those who reject Jesus will face judgment. And those who accept him are forgiven of their sins and indwelt by the Spirit. Number eight, now those who submit to King Jesus through faith and repentance are being transformed into his likeness, the image of God restored. That's one of the ways we can talk about our change. The image of God is being restored in us. It was marred and now it's being restored. And so Jesus comes as the image of God, Colossians 1.15. He's the perfect image of God. And now he's making us in his image. He's the, in other words, Genesis 1, Jesus is the truly human one. And so now he, in a sense, is restoring our humanity. We're becoming now what we were supposed to be, being restored in the likeness of Christ. That's why we talk so much about following him and being conformed to his image. Number nine, our purpose then is to know him, represent him, and expand his rule and help others do the same. That's why we're here. Know him, represent him in terms of our character, and expand his rule. That's why Genesis 1.28, be fruitful, have dominion, is really the Great Commission 1.0. And Matthew 28 is the Great Commission 2.0 that's really just the same thing he said in Genesis 1, but now in light of sin, in light of the spirit, in light of the resurrection. What does he say? Remember, 28.18 is what we got to start with. All authority has been given to me, therefore go. So all authority has been given to Jesus. He's the one. And now we go and we teach others everything that he commanded. We go and we, to use the language here, we spread his rule, the rule of Christ. We announce his lordship. That's what we see so much in Acts. And then finally, number 10, Christ will return and consummate his kingdom, raising his people from the dead and renewing this world that we might live and reign with him for eternity. Questions, comments, clarifications? All right, lessons we need to remember then, four of them. Number one, the purpose of history is to bring God's glory, bring God glory. It's the purpose of history. Why are we here to bring God glory? Why do we evangelize to bring God glory? 
Why did God create? For his own glory, Isaiah 43, 7. I already mentioned it. We exist for his glory. I love the way John Piper defines mission, and we could apply it to evangelism. In his book, Let the Nations Be Glad, he says, missions exist. We'll say evangelism exists because worship doesn't. Isn't that a good one-liner? Piper's got so many one-liners. Evangelism exists. Missions exist because worship doesn't. And that's what we want. We want Jesus Christ to receive more worship. That's why we go and evangelize for his glory. Number two, God is the evangelist. This is the beauty of this, and we'll talk more about this next week. He delights in saving sinners. So he's the one at work. We are just, in fact, let me flip there. You don't have to flip there with me if you don't want. But let me read from 2 Corinthians 4, 7. I love this verse when it comes to evangelism and ministry for that matter. Talking about the gospel, he says this, We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. I mean, just think about what we're doing. When we go to evangelize, remember, they're dead in sin, right? We're, we're, we're throwing out gospel tracts to the cemetery. Ephesians 2 says they're dead in sin. We're, we're preaching to the graveyard here. We have no hope. We cannot raise people from the dead spirits. There's nothing we can do. God's the one who does it. But how does he do it? He uses us. He uses us to save people. 2 Corinthians 5, he speaks through us as we're ambassadors. And here, he says, we're jars of clay, clay jars. Now, we've heard we're Bible, we're church people. We've heard this so much, we probably don't appreciate what he's getting at. In the first century context, it was the cheapest, cheapest thing available in terms of transporting anything. It's the cheapest thing he could find. What's the cheapest vessel or container I could find? Well, that'd be a clay jar. That's what we are, friends. Translate that, I think we're Walmart plastic sacks. It's as cheap as it comes. Walmart plastic sacks, that's what we are. But we have this treasure, the gospel, in the plastic Walmart sack. Why? Here's the purpose. To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. It's the message that he uses. It's not about us. It's about him and his glory and his power. He's the one who saves. God's the ultimate evangelist. Man, that's so encouraging to me. Even just right now. Even right now, or here in the next hours, I'm preaching, it's so encouraging to know that the Spirit's going to use the gospel message to build, to save, and to sanctify. And all I need to do is open the book, and the Spirit goes to work. Same with you in evangelism. All you, need to be, all you have to do is be faithful to the message. God goes to work. You Walmart plastic sacks. <laughs> Number one, purpose of history is to bring God's glory. Number two, God's the evangelist. Number three, we've been entrusted with the honor and responsibility of proclaiming the gospel. Kind of already said that, and we'll talk more about that in another, another session. But it is this message now that, that we proclaim. It's the good news that we've talked about. And it's what God uses to save, Romans 1. And then number four, God has left us in this time between the times for this purpose. You ever think about why we're here? It wasn't clear in the Old Testament that there would be two comings of Christ, two comings of the Messiah. He came, the king came, and this is why the disciples were so confused. The disciples thought he was going to eliminate Rome and establish a physical kingdom right then and there in the first century. They did not have a category for him dying. They didn't have a category for him leaving. He could have wrapped it all up in the first coming. He could have come and brought in the new creation in his first coming, but he didn't. Why? Why did he leave us here in this time between the times, this time between his first coming and his second coming? Well, we've already talked about it. Luke chapter 24 tells us why. So that the gospel, this message, can be proclaimed to all the nations. Or as Acts 1.8 says, you will receive the power of the Spirit and be witnesses of the risen Christ all over the world. The reason we're here then, the reason we're left here as a church in part is witness. It's mission. And any, any eschatology that doesn't get that missional impulse in terms of our purpose as a church is a false eschatology. I've got a couple charts for you. Maybe this will be helpful. So I've shared before, this is the, the typical Jewish way to look at history. Very linear. 
So you'd have this age, and so this age is all the things in the Old Testament. And there was all these promises, right? Think about the coming of the Messiah. Think about all the promises of the coming king. Think about the promises in Joel 2 that we looked at last week, and Isaiah 32, 15, and Isaiah 44, 3, and Ezekiel 36. At the end of the age, the, the Spirit will be poured out. And they thought that that would be it. And then along with that was what we call the general resurrection of the dead. They thought that history would end when the Spirit came and all of God's people were raised from the dead. That's the way they viewed history. Pretty linear, in the middle of history, new creation would come. This age, the age to come. The Bible used that language a lot. Well, we have the New Testament, and we have this mystery, something that was hinted at before, but now clearly revealed that history is not so neat. And so here's what New Testament history looks like. So you have this age overlapping with the age to come. So you have this age, and notice the first coming of Christ, the Gospels. The outpouring of the Spirit, Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, and the resurrection of Christ here in the middle of history. No one expected that. They expected all God's people to be raised at the same time. They didn't expect one man to be raised from the dead in the middle of history. What Jesus is doing is he's yanking God's future into the present with his resurrection. And he's then the guarantee and the first fruits of our resurrection. So now here we live in this time between the times. Notice his second coming. There's the general resurrection of the dead. And so here we're in this already not yet phase that started with the first coming of Christ and will be accomplished at the second coming of Christ. We call this geeks, we geeks call this inaugurated eschatology. Already not yet. The kingdom of God came in the first century, Matthew 3, 2, 4, 17, but it's not yet fully come. We wait on that. It will be consummated at Christ's second coming. So here we are in this Time between the times. Here we are in this already and not yet. Here, it is, here we are where the victory has been accomplished, yet ultimate victory is yet future. You think about D-Day and V-Day, right? D-Day has happened. It's a guarantee, but it takes a little time, and there's a war to be waged until V-Day is coming, but it's already guaranteed that it's going to come. And so what is our purpose there in that little box? Lots of things we could say, but one of the fundamental purposes, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, is witness. It's one of the main reasons we're here to know the Lord and grow in our relationship with him, to pursue him, to represent him, to put off sin, to put on righteousness, to help one another follow the Lord and say no to sin and yes to Jesus, and then to rule on his behalf, to witness to his saving reign so that more and more people might come to know him. And then eventually he'll wrap it all up. That's God's purpose in history. Final questions, thoughts, comments, disagreements, clarifications? All right, let me pray. Thanks for being here. Father, we're grateful for your word that lays out world history, not only biblical history, uh, not only personal history, but world history, and we're so glad to be a part of it. Thank you for including us in your plan. Thank you for revealing your purpose, plan, will to us that all things ultimately would be united in Jesus Christ and he would be preeminent. And I pray that we would all see our life purpose now to that end, that we would spend our time seeking to know you, seeking to be like you and represent you well in all that we do, and that we would seek to expand your rule and show others the good life, show others what it looks like to live under the rule of King Jesus. Pray for this summer class that it would bear much fruit. I pray that you would make us a strong evangelistic church. Pray that you would grow this church by conversion, that we would be able to see and celebrate you moving people from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of your beloved son. Give us favor and fruit. As we endeavor, even, even this week, give us easy opportunities. We're thankful that you're the one who does the work. Thankful that you entrust your treasure in us plastic sacks that you might receive the glory. Help us to do our part in being faithful. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.